Hunting season is in full swing. That means a lot of early mornings, a lot of long days. You get tired. Sometimes you need an extra energy boost. You're in luck. Primo's Hunting has teamed up with Pursuit Energy to bring you great tasting energy drinks without the spikes or crashes specifically engineered for the hunter in you. You can check these out today at primos.com or at pursuitenergy.com backslash collections backslash Primo's Hunting. For the next few weeks, we're going to be discussing a single subject in a more in-depth manner than we've ever done in the history of this podcast. Last week, we discussed the history of black bears, particularly right here in Mississippi. In a nutshell, we used to have a lot, they were nearly extirpated, and now, through intentional and consistent conservation efforts, we are seeing a comeback. The story that we're starting in on today is not all that different. But first, let me pose a few questions that may make you think. Right now, while you're listening to this podcast, whether you're driving down the road, sitting at your desk, got your headphones on at the gym, wherever you are, take a second to think about your favorite game species. This could be your favorite animal to hunt, your favorite animal to encounter in the woods, whatever. Think about that animal and then think about why that animal is your favorite. Maybe you had a really memorable bow hunt for a whitetail buck that's just always stuck with you. Maybe it was a duck hunt on a picture-perfect day, all your good buddies, and the number of ducks that came in that day matched the amount of laughs and stories that were shared in the blind. Maybe it was your first turkey hunt with your dad. Whatever that reason may be, I think we could all agree as outdoors men and women that the animals that we pursue mean something to us, something that transcends a single hunt for that animal. They mean so much to us that we form conservation organizations around them to ensure their preservation. We hang pictures of them in our houses. We talk nonstop about them with our friends. And historically, hunters and anglers go above and beyond to protect these animals and the places they live by pretty much whatever means necessary. That's why, in 2016, I was hit with a pretty strong dilemma. A good buddy of mine had just introduced me to upland bird hunting. I'll never forget the first time I saw a pointing dog lock up on a covey of quail, followed up by a flush of what was at least a dozen birds that were all but right under my feet. After the shotgun blast and the retrieval of the birds, I stood there in awe and completely hooked by this new type of hunting. Imagine my disappointment when I realized that at one point we had a huge population of quail at home in the southeast. It was right around that time my wheels started to spin. Where did all the quail go? How many quail did we actually have? Can we ever get them back? And that's where we pick up today. I knew at the beginning of this podcast I would need to get y'all hooked in right from the start, and there's no one better to do that than the first person I interviewed. It's time for y'all to meet Mr. Jimmy Bryan. Mr. Jimmy is a Mississippi native who's been quail hunting since the 1950s. He saw firsthand the decline of quail where he locally hunted, and now he is the owner of Prairie Wildlife, one of the biggest research centers for bobwhite quail in the entire region. This man lives and breathes quail conservation, and it was truly a joy to talk to him. I really wish we had more quail in Mississippi. (laughs) And at one time we did have that's and and that's why I was very interested in talking to you. I I wanted to hear, I guess, from your perspective. Um, I mean, just looking over this article that you wrote, you're talking about the mid 1950s, the yeah. 64 quail hunting. What what was it like back then? It was great. That, that was by far not the peak of quail hunting here. You know, we'd already declined some, but but I wasn't hunting back then. But mm-hmm. but in the 50s, I actually started hunt with my my brother-in-law he had bird dogs i started hunting with him mm-hmm. and just really got into it and then i got me a dog <clears throat> and most days i'd go by myself i get off work take my dog go to the woods i mean go to the place and mm-hmm. interestingly my dog knew where every cover of birds on the place was she'd get out she'd run down a hedgerow full speed and start hunting she never would hunt single she just suited me fine you know what how what better way to spend two or three hours a day mm-hmm. And then I started getting some friends to go with me. <clears throat> and so we had we had numerous birds. I could go out most any afternoon, find three or four coveys of birds. On Saturday, we might go out and find 10 or 12 coveys. But thinking back, I remember really before I started hunting, Daddy letting different folks hunt on us. And uh, we had one particular guy that we had a 100 acre place we bought, and two or three coveys of birds there. He goes down there and they kill about 40 or 50 birds. And mm-hmm. I said, I said, Daddy, we can't let that guy go back. He, he just out there slaughtering him. Yeah. He's not hunting. Yeah. 
I had another instance when I was hunting it, not at that time, but the next time I was hunting, I had an employee that bird hunted, and I had a couple of uh, customers in Illinois, and I said, look, take them out for him, take them quail hunting. Well, he comes back in with a croaker sack full of birds. Mm. I said, my God, Scott, what are you thinking about? He said, well, you said take them hunting. I didn't say go out and slaughter them. I banned him from ever hunting out here again. Mm. Another employee I had hunting with me used to, we'd be three or four of us, we'd horseback hunt. He'd always, every time he'd have a cover rise, he'd claim a couple of birds. So we just got our heads together and uh, we got up a couple of birds and nobody shot. And a bird didn't fall. He looked around and said, hey, you shoot, you shoot. And he just always jealous about it. Right. And I hunted with him until one day he told me he went out in the snow and shot a couple of birds on the ground under a tree bragging about it. And I said, LB, that's the worst thing I've ever heard. I never let him hunt on me again. Mm. I was, I, I never killed over the limit of doves. I dove hunted a fair amount, didn't really like it. Never killed over, over the limit of quail. But it's just the thrill of watching that dog work, finding those birds and that wild covey get up, just explode in front of you. Yeah. It's just, it's the most thrilling experience I ever had. Where did that, just listening to you talk, from the very beginning, you you had a, just a, you put a very high value on the quail. Yeah. Where did that come from for you? Don't know. Hmm. Uh, you know, my father was, he, he hunted some. I, I, I think I went hunting with him once. Uh, I know his younger years he hunted a lot. <clears throat> and he was always, it didn't seem like it, but conservation minded. I remember we were clearing a place. And he said, pile all those cedar trees up in a bush pile, a good place for quail to, you know, good quail cover. I never thought anything about that side of it at that time. I just thought it was a nuisance to leave a damn pile of brush out there. <laughs> but, you know, I guess it was just bred in me or, or something. Mm -hmm. uh, I, uh, and there was not a light bulb going off that told me I liked, liked it better than anything else. Mm -hmm. Just growing up. It was just always there for yeah. you. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I remember in the, I was in high school, and maybe prior to that, it seemed like half of the folks in West Point had dog boxes and pickup trucks and hunted two or three times a week. Mm -hmm. I quit hunting in 64. Uh, I had a fourth child coming, building a house, building a business, and my dog got run over. Mm. I didn't hunt again for, oh, 25 years. Really? But I noticed... With, with after a year or two, folks talked about not as many birds. And in the 70s, they said, you know, we, we, we don't have many birds anymore. By the 80s, nobody had a bird dog. And I think I'm right. In the early 70s, Earl Butts was Secretary of Agriculture. Mm -hmm. And his motto was plant fence row to fence row to feed the world. And that was the beginning of the downfall mm -hmm. of quail. And if you look at how we farmed when I was a kid, you had a lot of small farmers. We don't have any small farmers left out here. Three or four people on all the land. Everybody had a garden. You had two row, four row planters. So you had small fields, hedgerows around them. You had tenants that had gardens and mm -hmm. just a natural habitat for quail. Mm -hmm. we, didn't, we didn't do anything deliberate for quail. God just gave them to us. Mm. They took advantage of the you know, about terrain. Yeah. We cranked up our planting and, and it just got worse and worse. CRP came along, we said, well, that'll be good for quail. They required us to plant fescue, which is the worst grass you can plant. Yeah. We, we made, you know, we've all made a lot of mistakes by not thinking it through. Mm -hmm. uh, fescue held the land together well, but a quail couldn't live on it. Yeah. And if you look now, I had a, a banker here when, oh, five or six years ago. And we were riding down the road, and he said, man, this fast field, he's a beautiful farmer. I said, yeah, he is. And he said, that's me across the road, and mine, mine looks shabby. But I said, look, there's nothing between the road and that hill that a quail can hide in, or any game can hide in. I've got field borders, and I've got hedgerows. And uh, he was impressed when he saw that place. When I told him that, he became more impressed with my place. Hmm. And... Uh, but it's, it's uh, you know, I talk to a lot of people about it. Some of them try it and don't have the patience to stick with it. Right. 
and there's no easy, cheap way to do it. Mm. And, uh, and it takes some perseverance. And, uh, uh, but I'll, I'll have somebody get interested in they quit. I got a, a guy now that hunts with me some. He just fired up with it. Now, he comes down here, calls Mark all the time. Mark finally told him the other day, he said, you, you can't spend that much money. He was, <laughs> he was wanting to put fences around all the shrubs he's planting. <laughs> but if he stays with it, he's got the place at one place. One time was a wonderful quail place. Yeah. But uh, but it's a long, hard battle, and we'll yeah. never get back to, you know, it'll never be the same. Right. That's what I, I was talking to um, Dr. Greg Harper about it. Mm-hmm. And he mentioned kind of what you were going back to, that story you were telling about the guy who was talking about how nice the farm looked yeah. and clean, and that's what it, it's. I you know I don't know where that came from that that that's the way to do it you know fence row to fence row everything clean well, and stuff like that maximize the production get every can every right. can out of it right but that's and it's it's interesting like how I'm trying to figure out how to frame up this question so if someone you know were to come and look at prairie wildlife now i mean it, and and see just kind of a like well, mark said it earlier when we were interviewing him, he said they're kind of, y'all are kind of to a point of just a a maintenance point here mm-hmm. you know y'all have done so much work with it when did all this start with this place when did you decide i'm gonna do i'm gonna invest so much into making this you know a place for quail yeah. well <clears throat> when i started back hunting i bought two bird dogs and hell found I didn't have any birds. Mm. You know, we we had, had two or three guys, old time hunters that would hunt with me. Had two guys I could call them, and in fifteen minutes they'd be here. Mm-hmm. You know, just they were just that avid. But we'd hunt, hunt. We might. I had a wagon then. We might ride the wagon for uh, three hours and find two covers of birds, mm. kill two or three birds. But just it was just worth it. So, but I decided I, I needed to do something. So I called Dr. Westberger one day, and it was probably 25 years ago. And I said, Dr. Berger, I want to know what I need to do to bring quail back to this property. So he came out, and uh, <clears throat> he said, well, how many coveys do you know on this place? That's this one 3,200-acre block. He said, I don't, know, I, don't, I don't want you telling me what somebody told you. I said, how many coveys do you know? And I said, well, Wes, it's three or four that I know. He said, well, we can populate this place if you do what I say. We spent the whole day. And I got through and I said, well, Wes, you're telling me I need to take it back to what it was in the 50s. He said, that's exactly right. Mm-hmm. So we had already done, started doing some repairing work on the creeks. To, to, it was a government subsidized program and it stopped erosion. That wasn't the best thing for quail, but it, it, it did put, put habitat in. <clears throat> then I started planting a little native grass, and uh, my uh, nephew told me, he said, well, you know, NRCS will help you. So back then it was AS, I don't know what it was. Uh, they'd help you on the repair deal, and you get reimbursement. I said, well, hell, that's, that's about a deal. And then Wes started doing research over here. He had me doing all these things, and I was not very happy because... I wasn't seeing any results. Mm. Uh, and about, the, I don't know, uh, somewhere two or three years after we started, he started doing this research on this CP33 program, planting buffers around grain fields. Mm. And I always accused them. They did this study showing that this land didn't produce, but off put it in grass. Like a lot of these studies, you know what you want the results to be, so that's what you write. But <clears throat> anyway, we signed up everything that would fit in the program that had to be farmed for the last three years. So mm-hmm. had fence, fence rows around it. <clears throat> I never had taken down. They were grown up in hedges, so I decided just to clip the tops out, make hedgerows, put this grass buff out there. And uh, within a year or two, I started seeing all kinds of birds, not quail. I see red birds, and just all kinds of birds mm-hmm. I'd never seen out here before. Yeah. And then we started seeing quail. And... Uh, I still wasn't happy because I couldn't go out and find 10 covers of birds. And, mm. uh, but Wes said, just be patient. He said, I've already talked to the federal authorities, and with all the work you're doing, we'll try trapping and translocating some birds. Mm. Well, the next year, our numbers went up. We didn't do that. Then he started doing these cover counts. And at one point, he said we had over the whole place 60 or 70 coveys that they could document. 
And he said, we can extrapolate that into 100 cubbies. And I said, well, I'm not going to believe it till I see it. And I never did see it. <laughs> but I did see a lot more birds. Yeah. A lot of them were just cubbies of four or five. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> but we did have, I, I had, what was a huntable population? Yeah. But I never did hunt them much. I, I hunted them, but we didn't shoot much. But uh, <clears throat> then we went to a spell that he got promoted up. I got busy in the cattle business, and we didn't do any maintenance. And then, uh, like one particular place, every time I went to the coverage, we had 15 birds there. The, for three or four years in a row. The next year, there were no birds there. But I'd let it grow up, and it wasn't habitable. Mm -hmm. So we started back. And I, I was, after 60 years, I was trying to train the cows anyway. <laughs> and I put put all my time over here. Mm -hmm. And we started back on all this program. Then I started in the release program to try to offset some cost. And uh, I'd bought some land about three miles south of here and finally pieced together some partials where it was all contiguous all the way through. Mm -hmm. So we do all the release hunts down there. Uh, then that started bringing people in and revenue in. And revenue's still too short, but we are slowly <laughs> getting there. But uh, <clears throat> It, it, we just, we didn't have any planned growth. It just grew on itself. Yeah. You know, we're going to build this lodge. There's going to be a little shooting, a little camp for the kids, you know, and the family. It got out of hand. I never, <laughs> and I've never spent the night out here. <laughs> but, uh, but it's, uh, you know, I'm rambling a little bit, but uh, I, I, I really got started when I talked to Burger and, and then. And we started seeing stuff. You know, we planted a lot of native grass. I'd go out every week looking for it. <laughs> he said, just quit looking. He'll be there next year. <laughs> so, and next year it was there. Yeah. Uh, so I, I've been well pleased that, that, you know, I won't live long enough to do all the things I want to do. Mm. But but if you don't have something you want to do, why do you need to be here? <laughs> you know, that's, that's the way I feel. A, that's a good point. Yeah. That's a good point. How much research have you allowed them to do out here? It's you know, uh, let me back up just a little bit. Okay. Uh, Dr. Berg and I, I, I told Wes, I said, I'll, I'll put over five years, I'll put $250,000 in an endowment. Mm. We'll try to raise other money for it, provided y'all hire somebody specifically dedicated to quail research. Mm. Well, it went along two years, maybe three years, and I, I told him, I said, I'm going to put half of it in a cash fund so you got something to work with. And, but we didn't have anybody really on top of it. And I, I told, I called Wes, and I said, you know, I'm not putting any more money in this. I'm going to spend the money here if, unless you hire somebody. Well, that year, the dean agreed to put it in the budget, make it uh, in perpetuity. We went out and hired Mark, and that's when we really got started mm. uh, on this deal. And since then, we've got the endowment's up about $2 million. We had one really big benefactor that gave money for it. And uh, all this money, it's the earnings of that money go to, to mark to use for research, to hire graduate students and do all this work. Mm -hmm. So uh, we, we've got that established. Uh, and I think we, we, we'll probably still grow that fund some. Yeah. But, but as long as we've got that and we've got Mark in the budget, committed to doing continual research and it was understood when he came, that he would do classroom work, but most of his work would be outside. Mm -hmm. And he's done a phenomenal job. But prior to him, we we had, I told Wes one, one year, I said, I'm going to name this Maples North because there are more trucks, Mississippi State trucks here than the old campus. <laughs> but they were doing every kind of research in the world. Yeah. You know, quail, rats, uh, butterflies, had uh, folks from all over the world working for them. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and, he told me once, he said, it's the best research I ever got. It didn't cost me anything to do this. That's the reciprocal arrangement. You know, I get help from them, they help me. Uh, but I got a lot of good ideas out of them. Mm -hmm. And they found a few first out here that uh, in Mississippi, uh, I forget what they were, but uh, but they've done all kind of research and been great partners. Yeah. And it's just 20 minutes from campus. Yeah. So it's just in the back door. There's a... There's a picture I had seen before. It's hanging on the hallway in there as well. And yeah. it's it's a picture of you releasing a, a bird. Yeah. Mark said it was from one of the research projects that y'all were, were doing out here. Yeah. Olivia would call me every time she had one trapped to tag it. 
Yeah. And I uh, uh, put the collar on and said, you want to come release it? <laughs> I, I think I did a couple of them that way. But yeah. uh, she was so excited about catching those things. And, yeah. and she'd give me all these specific instructions on how to hold it and how to release it. And <laughs> <laughs> made a big deal out of it. But uh, And I was, they called me a couple of times when they uh, had some caught in the traps. They had these mist nets, I think they called them. Mm-hmm. And it's a little fine net. They take them forever to get the bird out of there. And, uh, but they, she did a wonderful job of, of uh, sometimes she was out here 16, 18 hours a day, Mark said. Yeah, Just yeah. Really a dedicated young lady. Mm-hmm. It's, I mean, it had to have meant something to you, the, you know, the landowner, you know, getting to release a bird oh, yeah. like it, that. that it, I mean, that's, that's. It did. I mean, a truly wild bird raised you. Yeah. And when you release him, he's gone just in a, in a flash. Yeah. Going back to doing what he does. That's right. <laughs> <clears throat> yeah. It was, uh, I, I love watching it. I'm hearing more people have interest about quail than I ever have. Yeah. Well, and, and that was one of our goals as as our marketing guy said, we're going to make quail up romantic again. Yeah. At this, you know, and Mark fusses a little bit about having a shooting preserve and the wild birds. I said, I said, Mark, that's just life today. Yeah. Uh, but you, you never, you're never going to have a sustainable number of wild birds to shoot around here. If you don't have shooting preserves, nobody's got anywhere to go. They don't get a chance to shoot them. They don't appreciate them. And, and, and it's amazing how many people just like to see the dog work. Yeah. See, it, see it, the dog's point and then, and then retrieve, uh, you know, the, how, how can a dog do that? And I said, well, they just got God-given instinct. <laughs> but, uh, it is, the, I mean, I've yet, I mean, I'm sure there's there may be some out there, but I've yet to meet a bird hunter, a quail hunter, to any degree that there's not just an, an immense factor is just about that dog. Yeah. I mean, the it's dog just is, all part of it. Yeah. Now, <clears throat> you know, you have got South Georgia mm-hmm. with massive plantations uh, where they do have numbers of wild birds. You never get to hunt them unless you know the right person. Mm-hmm. But those come at a big cost. Yeah. They, 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 they have to spend a lot of money t- maintaining them. Then you go to Texas, to Kansas, to Oklahoma in the right year, and it's cheap bird hunting out there because they got so many. Right. But you might not have that but once every three years. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, that, you know, we're not a, as affected as the West with droughts and, and all. Mm-hmm. But we're affected a lot by row crop farming. Mm-hmm. And, I'm, and I'm on the other side of the fence and ultra grain elevators, and I don't want to see all the land plowed up and put in grass. Mm-hmm. So we, would have, we would have grain, but there's a place for both. There's a balance. Yeah. It's about finding a way to have both. Yeah. You can still have what we need for for humans and, and life to go on, but you can do that while allowing quail to still exist yeah. on the landscape. I don't think many people would go to the extent I have, but actually this side of a place is the least productive land we got. Mm. And when the, Dr. Berger came to me about doing a FAA study, planting native grass to to measure the impact of birds, something they can do around airports. And I told him something, he said, well, he said, no, I don't know whether we'll do that or not. I said, well, think about this, Phil. They're talking about giving you $65 or $70 an acre a year guaranteed for five years. And back then, we, you weren't making $65 an acre off the land. Mm-hmm. And uh, <clears throat> he said, well, I've already put some fertilizer down. I said, just give them fertilizer. I said, that's land you don't have to take any risk on. It's your least productive ground, and we can develop something out of it. So mm-hmm. when that program was over, then we started, you know, breaking it down and getting it back into better habitat for quail. Yeah. But, uh, it, you know, like the field borders, the CP33s, as long as the government's paying a competitive rate with rental rates, I don't know why anybody wouldn't do that and stay with it. Mm-hmm. But now my neighbor across the street, he used to have a lot of birds on his place. Today, as he, the only birds he's got to come across the road for me. Mm-hmm. I tried my best to talk him into going into the CP33 program. To, it would help us and help him. But he, he just never would do it. Mm-hmm. So there's nowhere, nowhere for wildlife to exist on that place anymore. Right. Yeah. And you see that a good bit these yeah. days, unfortunately. Yeah. But if it weren't – but, again, I'm, I'm, I'm an optimist. Like Mark said, yeah. a lot of quail guys are – he said they're cautiously optimistic, yeah. and I, I I agree with that. I like that terminology, but it's like I, I the, while you are seeing a fair amount of landscapes or tracts of land that's 
you know, pretty much scratch barren of anywhere wildlife can yeah. live. You are seeing places that are that are starting to pay attention to, to well, wildlife. Again. You know, if I got a neighbor, you know, I asked Dr. Bergen one time, I said, Wes, I'm doing the same things similar to what they're doing in South Georgia. They, they all have lots of birds. He said, well, research has shown that 25% of the birds you raise are going somewhere else. Hmm. You don't have anybody raising birds to replace them. Now, now they lose 25%, but they pick them up for somebody else. It kind of makes sense when you think about it. Yeah. So if I got a neighbor up here that can house two coveys of quail and another one over here can house two or three coveys, you, you got a road for a road a highway for them to travel on. Mm. So uh, you don't have to have a wide expanse of ground. If you got the proper habitat, I think 30 or 40 acres, you can hold a covey of quail. Mm-hmm. But if you got enough of those scattered around, you, you, you begin to build a, a – the biggest satisfaction you're going, you're going to get probably is hearing a whistle, but you can't shoot them very hard. But. There's still satisfaction in yeah, that. It's great. Yeah. I had any number of people over the last several years, you know, I had a, heard a quail whistle. I hadn't heard that in years. Mm-hmm. And one guy at church told me, he said, I got a covey of birds. I got a pile of brush out behind my house. I don't know where they came from. And he said, I got a big old hawk hanging around there. I'm fixed to kill that sucker. I love to hear those birds do the horse. <laughs> So, and he was probably a bird hunter when he was young. Yeah, you know, mm-hmm. and he was as proud of that as if he'd been had a new Cadillac. Mm-hmm. I promise you. I was turkey hunting this past spring on a, a a lease that we had, and we were walking to another spot, and uh, me and um, Jimmy Primos, mm-hmm. and we were walking and kicked up a single quail. He yeah. got up, flew, and I just I it locked me up in my steps. Yeah. And I just watched him, and, and Jimmy looked at me, and I said, I said that was a quail. Yeah. That was a quail. And that, I don't think we – whether we we didn't kill a turkey that day, I couldn't tell you what happened for the rest of that day. All I yeah. thought about was that quail that yeah. we found. I was so happy. Yeah. Yeah, he's he's making it out here, yeah. you know. It's pretty but, amazing. You know, I, uh, I used to talk to several of these deer hunters. Didn't we? we didn't do a lot of deer hunting. We had several blinds. One guy told us, I've seen – he stayed on that blind two days. I've seen that covey birds go by four times. <laughs> just walk right by right under me you mm-hmm. know i didn't even know it was come in that area the first the first quail that i ever saw in my lifetime was uh that same piece of family ground in webster county where my grandparents were mm-hmm. that i was talking about earlier uh, i'll never forget it um because i had heard stories about quail at the time and i just had t- was told they weren't you know they're not here like they used to be and yeah. so i was sitting in a, a homemade box stand with my dad yeah and here comes a, it was about probably about eight to ten quail, and I didn't know what they were because I'd never seen them. Yeah. And my dad was was freaking out. I'm like, what? What? He said, that's quail. That's yeah. quail. And uh, I remember sat there and watched them. And uh, we actually there was a bobcat came out and started trying to get yeah. to the quail. And my dad elected to spook the bobcat and the quail. Because he would rather do that than watch the bobcat catch the yeah. quail. And I was, I was like, I understand that. Yeah. <laughs> Well, you know, the picture you showed me, your granddad and his brothers, mm-hmm. at that time, half of a county seemed like hunted quail. Yeah. That was, but it, we had no deer. We had no turkeys. I, I never, we lived on the river when I was in high school. Never saw a deer. Never saw a turkey. Mm-hmm. And uh, now, I get up in the morning, I'm drinking coffee. I got 13 deer in my backyard. <laughs> and, I, and I live in the city. Yeah. Well, in the town. Mm-hmm. But, uh Back then, we were one of the noted quail hunting places. Mm-hmm. The first Grand National Quail Hunt was held here in Clay County. Okay. Back in 1890-something. Mm. Wow. Left here because of a smallpox epidemic, and it got up to Ames. It'll never, you know, never leave there. Mm-hmm. But uh, but back that was that was a gentleman sport. Everybody loved it. Yeah. But it didn't. You didn't have to be a gentleman. It was that was a lot of happy times for outdoorsmen. Yeah. Well, Mr. Jimmy, I, I'm I'm super appreciative of your time and sharing what you what you've shared with me today. Well, I appreciate you doing this. You you you're gonna help the quail hunters. That's what I want to do. Okay, that's what I want to do. Enjoyed it. I'm gonna be completely honest here. Over the past six years of doing this show, I've gotten the privilege to interview a lot of truly incredible people. It's been one of the best parts of the job, hands down. But Mr. Jimmy is gonna be one of those that always sticks out to me. To see and talk to a man that has such a strong affection for bobwhite quail and their habitat, and then to truly put his money and actions where his mouth is, to see him have a hard time talking about what once was without crying, 
it's impossible to not respect him. I think we could all learn a thing or two from Jimmy Bryan. For the last part of this episode, we're going to hear from a man by the name of Andy Edwards. Andy is the program coordinator for Quail Forever and was born and raised in Tennessee. He has a story and perspective on quail and quail hunting that I think we could all appreciate. You're from the southeast. I am. You born and raised in Tennessee? That's right. right. That's right. Pulaski, Tennessee. How does a person like you have the interest in quail that you have? Oh, man. Oh, gosh. There's a lot of a lot of things rolled up into that answer. <laughs> but I, I would say, you know, history and tradition, of course. My, um, my dad and, and, you know, his buddies all quail hunted. And I mm. remember them walking in with you know limited quail in the early 80s and just thinking it was the coolest thing in the world right they ran setters mostly and um just going from that to meeting guys in college that uh that hunted and then just getting involved in the wildlife field um doing several different things I actually worked on bears for my masters and love waterfowl and thought uh you know might go that way but an opportunity came about for me in 2003 with pheasants forever and mm-hmm. so, so i went to indiana and uh, I remember my dad and I pulled up to, to Rochester, Indiana, and the lake was frozen over, and there were people fishing out on the dang ice. And he was like, what have I done? I yeah. brought you to the to the frozen north. But uh, that's where it all began for me was, man, up in Indiana with Pheasants Forever. And then when we started Quail Forever in 2005, uh, we were a small organization then, about 50 people, and I was basically the only Southerner. And, right. Uh, I don't know if by default or, or by the grace of God, got to come back home and uh, live in my hometown and yeah. still do to this day. What was it like, um, I guess, plotting out a trail for Quail Forever in the southeast? Um, you know, at first it was, it, I would love to tell you that we had this great master plan, but it was kind of a, um, you know, uh, <laughs> go get them, boys. Yeah. Uh, it was a, there was a lot of interest in a new model for qu- quail conservation there were some other other folks in that game um you know quail unlimited was still around at that time but we were we were coming into it from an uh an aspect that states had asked us up in the midwest where we had pheasant chapters in the northern half of that state like indiana illinois ohio even missouri uh, partly in iowa there were there were pheasants but then there were also quail but we weren't working in those areas right. because people wanted to pheasants forever chapter. yeah yeah and they were like why don't you start a quail forever because all the money stays locally you know or the decision to how to spend those funds stays with that chapter and we're like well would they want to start a pheasant chapter and like, nobody would you know that they wanted they're in quail country so right. we that's how the quail forever model came about and and we we were being asked by states we were being asked by volunteers and then in the southeast in particular we had some great states that wanted to partner with us pretty early on and um, so I came and covered eight states or originally in the Southeast and started chapters where there were interested volunteers and we built on, on that and then added people as we could, yeah. uh, throughout the time. Our first people came on board in 2013 in Tennessee. So, gotcha. Yeah. But let me, um, how many people, if any, did you ever have or still have conversation with folks that down here in the southeast region since that's the kind of majority of where we're talking about with Mm -hmm. this podcast sure do you ever have any conversations with folks that just are completely amiss that quail are a thing in the southeast yeah occasionally we we have a lot of people who i would say um unfortunately think quail are gone a lot of times they're like oh there are still quail around it's like yeah they're they're still quail around and quite honestly some a lot of that comes about um, people that are out, you know, actively hunting quail understand that they're still birds, and they're tough to find in, in some cases. But um, most often it's from an older generation that, that we get that comment. It's like, yeah, they're not near as many quail as yeah. there were when you were young, probably. Right. But we're also riding around on paved roads mm-hmm. with our air conditioners on and our windows up, and we're not out beating the bushes like we might have done when we were 50 years younger right um and so most of the time um deer hunters aren't seeing quail and hearing quail because they're not in areas where they're Mm -hmm. where they're going to be found anyway they're not Mm -hmm. mature woods um but it it yeah there's definitely uh, 
conversations that that we have and we have volunteers that are involved that don't quail hunt but they love the habitat they love mm. you know that sort of thing but yeah we have quite a few conversations with people that that aren't aware of what a huge thing mm-hmm. it used to be down here gotcha did you you know going back to where you know you said how you grew up and remembering your dad and your dad's friends quail hunting did mm-hmm. you get to get in involved in any of that the, the quail hunting down here not really um so for me it started in college um and just got an opportunity through some friends to to go because i was saying i remembered it i I was probably five when he got rid of his his bird dog Mm -hmm. yeah i actually remember uh, deer hunting probably was 11 10 or 11 and some neighbors of ours we were they had permission to bird hunt on our property but we were up there deer hunting and i watched them move two coveys in front of us in a in an over well now i look it back and it was an overgrown cattle pasture we had had cows um sold off the cows kind of things were growing up and uh looking back it was like the perfect mix for for quail habitat right they moved two coveys in front of me like i had the bird's eye view watching just watch all this go on i'm like dude i i want to do that yeah the heck was sitting up here freezing yeah and my walls blizzard proofs um you know back (laughs) in the day uh i want to go do that yeah what's here's what's interesting and like i said i i so i garnered like a personal interest in quail mm-hmm. by getting to go and then that spark what you and i have kind of talked about this off record you know kind yeah. of getting ready for this whole podcast is it's so i got an interest in quail and then it started like kind of resurfacing these memories that i had when i was younger that yeah. i just didn't that weren't as significant to me because i didn't have as much of a personal sure. interest in quail sure and uh I remember uh, when I was, like I said, I um, grew up hunting. I didn't grow up, but my hunting, my first hunting experiences happened in Webster County, Mississippi. Okay. And uh, I was probably, I mean, I had to, I was somewhere under the age of 10 and I was sitting in this homemade, on sitting on the ground deer stand with my dad uh, in these and I, there was this uh, cubby of quail just came walking out into this lane of a food plot. And I'd never seen quail before. Yeah. I didn't know what they were. What is that? My dad, I, I was like, what is that? And my, I remember my dad getting like, oh, my gosh, it's quail. It's quail, you know. Yeah. And 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 I've, where, and just backtracking a little bit, I still can remember as well um, standing in the front yard of my grandparents' house in the driveway. And my grandfather, we called him Daddy Dole. And his friends, his brothers, whoever, they would they would talk about, sometimes they'd be talking about running deer and their deer dogs, but mm-hmm. then they would talk about quail hunting. Yep. They would talk about the glory days, and they would talk about how good the quail hunting used to be. Yep. Some of them still had old bird dogs that were just like, you know, just lingering pieces of a time that sure. had slipped away. What's interesting is, so I've talked to Craig Harper. Um, you connected me with him. Yep, great guy. What was interesting is like, I, I, I shared that story with Craig, and and uh, doc, he said he was like, you have the same story that I have growing up in North Carolina mm-hmm. where he was. You have a similar story yep. from Tennessee, yep. and it's like this all happened kind of at the same time, but not right. really. Sure. It's like it's it, it, it's the same story, but just kind of it, it it's like it happened at different instances in these yep. regions. Yep, It's and it started – that's one of the hard things to, and you want to talk to people about quail resurgence, um, quail restoration efforts, but then we have to understand that this didn't start in the last 10 years, man. This yeah. has been, I would say, um, conservatively a 50 to 70 year uh, mm-hmm. problem, you know, starting in the, we'll say in the 50s, uh, and, um, but but things have happened over time, particularly in the east where we get a lot of rainfall, Yeah, and, and the you know, you look at it, and we basically have about the same amount of forest that we had back in the fifties. But those have aged by yeah. fifty to seventy years, mm-hmm. and they're no longer um, productive for quail. Uh, we've taken away the fire culture in in some parts of the South now, and um, you know, definitely in the coastal plain, it's still alive and well. But um, there, there's a less you know less prevalent fire culture mm-hmm. throughout much of the Southeast, mm-hmm. which is which has not helped as well. And, we don't have the diversity we used to have in around crop fields, those sorts of things. So a lot of, a lot of factors in, involved in bringing about that decline, but yeah, you're, you're right. It was for, for me, it felt like the mid eighties was where we really started noticing, but there were, there were sustainable, you know, and, and kind of huntable populations that pretty popular quail hunting around mm-hmm. Southern, Southern middle Tennessee through the nineties. Yeah. 
Yeah. What do you? What was one of the things that's been most interesting to me so far that I've learned? I'm, I mean, I've, I'm learning a lot of stuff through this process of, mm-hmm. of building this podcast, but it's just like how wildly different our landscape used to be down here. Oh man. Um, you were touching on a little bit, and I, for the sake of this, if you could go into it again, um, about how the Civil War even affected some of it. Oh yeah, yeah, and that, that, so I go way back, uh, and just and my dad loves to to metal detect, and so we had some Civil War sites around home, and just started thinking about that and looking at some of the uh, Brady was a real popular photographer then. He did mm-hmm. a whole lot of the Civil War photos, but. Um, man, in a lot of those photos, and I'm not saying it was good for the land in general because there was a whole lot of dirt washing off the hills, but there was a ton of open ground throughout most of the southeast because mm. of, you know, they were hillside farming for uh, plowing the dirt. They were they were cutting trees not only for, um, you know, they were cutting it for firewood. They were cutting it to build houses, um, and and they were powering their cook you know their wood stove year round to cook on and. Uh, so lots and lots fewer trees, which as you've talked to Harper already, uh, quail are not dependent on a tree for anything. Yeah. Uh, they're not a, they're not a, a, um, forest bird uh, yeah. like grouse are. So, um, more shrubland obligate species. And so, yeah, they, they started then and then through reconstruction, through urbanization or, or may, maybe industrialization, um, people moved off the farms in you know, all the way through the 50s and then i think that's where the culmination of that happened is you see kind of this starting in the 50s the numbers really started showing up yeah for the decline in, in birds all the way through where we are today yeah and the thing that was i guess just so intriguing to me about that is i didn't know that we as humans were is playing i mean i knew we played a factor as far as things that have caused the decline. Sure. But I didn't know when he was talking about, well, a lot of the reason is because, like you were saying, the farming and the cutting the trees for this. I was like, wait, we were doing good things for quail without even realizing it? Mm-hmm. That's wild to me. It yeah. just shows, we, I, I am constantly astounded by how much of an influence we as a species, humans, yep. have on everything else without oh, sure. even realizing sure. it. And, and it's, it's, that's why I think it's so baffling to people is because we were, we had quail and we weren't trying. Yeah. We we're just doing the things <laughs> that we did. And now we have to try really hard to have quail. Mm-hmm. Um, and so sometimes people get frustrated with that. Like, well, if it was so easy back then, why, why not now? But mm-hmm. it was that everybody was just kind of doing it as a byproduct of, you know, two row planters and two row corn pickers. Yeah. And bush hogs weren't around and electric fences weren't around and, Quite honestly, we man we use herbicides very effectively to manage for quail, but herbicides also reduce diversity at times, mm-hmm. you know, on on croplands. And so, uh, a lot of things that we were just man, it was just part of rocking and rolling and doing doing what we were doing. Mm-hmm. Bird, birds everywhere. Yeah, uh, I live fairly near a Amish community uh, in Lawrence County, Tennessee, and if you go over there, you'll find you'll find birds. You'll hear birds in the spring, um, you know, and it's you know you think about it well it's a throwback to what because of their farming practices that's incredible yep and it's a small little niche you know micro kind of community there but uh for for a probably 15 20 mile circle there uh, there's there's some birds around Mm -hmm. but they're farming it with horses (laughs) and you know yeah not just not to say we can go back to that on a grand scale but it uh it works there's shaker village in in uh kentucky they you know, it was a quail focal area for years and a similar situation where they were kind of farming it the old way mm-hmm. they had birds um, but success now i think another positive is that success now for a quail hunter is measured on hey we got we flushed three cubbies of birds today man and yeah. uh, we got a few birds we had great dog work i wouldn't think there's five percent of quail hunters out there that consider a, a bag limit you know what it takes to be successful see that that's the other thing it's it's interesting it's like when you i had i've found that like i if i try to make an argument to somebody about that hasn't quail hunted you know and 
they're trying they're like why would i want to do that yeah and uh, you know not in a negative way but they're like explain to me what the draw is here yep. i feel like i don't even have to go that far in i'm like the the habitat dogs yep. dogs working yep. fellowship oh yeah like it's not like i feel like it's not that hard of a sell like th- so you and i and mike this morning right so we we're out here um just to kind of explain to everybody where we are, we, we're here at Prairie Wildlife in West Point, Mississippi. Um, Andy was gracious enough to kind of put this together with a you know a couple of folks that I could talk to about Bob White Quail. But before we did our interview this morning, um, you have your dog here. Mike has a young dog, and so we were able to go out. Not with not we weren't hunting. We didn't have guns, but we were just working the dog because yeah. Mike has a young dog, and we. Yeah, found a couple quail. His young dog got to get in on it. Yeah. Your dog pointed a couple. We were as happy as we could be oh, if we shot a bag limit of quail. Right, walked around <laughs> for an hour and moved birds. And and uh, you know, I think at one point I looked over and I said, "Hey guys, we're all getting paid right now. It's kind of crazy." <laughs> uh, but yeah, you know, we're 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 having fun. We're working. But it it like to see that young dog. The, you know, the I think it was the fourth encounter we had with some birds. Um, dog my dog points she's holding tight which is not always the case but anyway she's right there and here comes mike's dog behind and all this you just see it happen it's yeah. like boom hey what's going on here you know and that dog's tail goes nuts and all of a sudden it stops and he's looking right where he's supposed to be and it's, mm-hmm. that's what it's all about yeah yeah if you try to put it on paper for the uh, accountant okay so we have a you know not not inexpensive dog purchase we buy food year round we uh we we spend gallons and gallons of fuel to go get there and we come home with uh three ounces of uh three ounces of meat <laughs> per bird a uh, good day is going to be a couple three of those yeah it, it's not going to pay out based on that yeah but man the experience is all worth it um and i think more often than not now and and i say the southeast but it's all over we have we have traveling bird hunters mm-hmm. you know we want to we want to get on the road and go and and hunt new places and see new things and and experience the the greasy spoons and the the um the the prairies and the fields and just different landscapes and get out there and follow the dog mm-hmm. that's what it's all about yeah for sure um, i was talking to uh, uh mike and i were talking about this last night on the ride back uh and I have noticed in the probably in the past, I'd say three or four year time frame, maybe. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I've tried to like, I try to remove the bias a little bit because I know I'm a fan of Upland birds. Hey, don't don't fight it. Just just <laughs> just go ahead and hug a quail. It's but okay. it's like, but it's like I was t- I was like, it's like Mike, I'm telling you, it's like I've just noticed a a like a renewed spark of interest in yeah. bird hunting. Yeah, I I think you're you're absolutely right and i i of course i'm looking at it through a totally skewed lens but i really think um there's some things that happened in 2020 that made us all realign our priorities yeah uh you know i'm not saying covid was good by any means but for the conservation community what we saw was this huge resurgence and particularly i mean just anybody getting outdoors or that you know millions more people Mm -hmm. getting outdoors but really um you may not think this but upland hunting is pretty easy entry point yeah um it's not probably the easiest it it doesn't have to include a dog though it most often does and i would argue it's better with one but yeah um but uh, it doesn't even have to include a a a pointer um my first dog was a a lab a flusher and we did awesome on mostly pheasants but we hunted grouse and and occasionally quail as well but of course ducks but um yeah man i think you're right that there's this resurgence in upland hunting or let's just say small game hunting because yeah. it could be rabbits and squirrel and and birds um but i think people want to get that experience they want to be outdoors and uh really connected to the land out walking and mm-hmm. and and enjoying it i really hope you enjoyed this first part at an in-depth look at the story of quail here in the southeast In coming episodes, we're going to dive deeper into the individual factors that cause the decline across our region, as well as where numbers are currently and what the outlook might be in the future. As always, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out. You can hit up the Primo's page or my personal page, and we'll see you back here next time. As always, thank you for listening to the Speak the Language podcast presented by Onyx Hunt.